All right, so basics, and then we're gonna talk about um, today, we are gonna talk about how the foods you consume turn into energy. So that's the whole premise of this chapter five nutrition chapter, okay? Um, so there's a couple things not in your textbook from here. Um, for, for our purposes, everything in this PowerPoint is what you're gonna wanna know from chapter five um, out of your textbook. Okay, so let's talk about the basic macronutrients. So we have uh, protein, fats, and carbohydrates. So let's start off with protein. Now, one thing you need to understand with protein, fat, and carbohydrates is that all three of the macronutrients are comprised of a carbon, a hydrogen, and an oxygen. Okay, and they all have different amount. They all, all three of those macronutrients have different amounts of carbs, of, of a carbon, of a hydrogen, and an oxygen, and they're arranged differently. Now, what's so important about that is that um, all three macronutrients can be broken down, metabolized to create energy because all three of them have a carbon, a hydrogen, and an oxygen. And when we move forward into understanding how your body um, expends energy for exercising, we're gonna see where these various carbons, hydrogens, and oxygen come into play. And we're gonna try and keep it very basic uh, because this gets really intense when you get into 380 or X-Phys. Um, so we're, try, we're gonna try to keep it non X-Phys intensity, if you will. So with protein, you need to know that there's four calories for every one gram of protein, okay? What's a calorie? What is a calorie? Or a kcal, kilocalorie? It's the amount of energy that's required to heat up one thing of water for like one degree Celsius. Okay. And so what we're talking about with energy, okay, you hear a lot of people say, hey, you know, I ran today and I burned 200 calories. Okay. Um, you know, that, that's the lingo for it. It's more we expended this amount. And so calories, um, as we get, when we get to the body management or weight management chapter, calories is just essentially a, a measure of how fast we raise um, a certain temperature. We, we, we can call it thermogenesis, the creation of heat. So when we exercise, we are creating heat in our body, which expends energy. In addition to that, right, we need energy to, full, uh, to create muscular um, contractions. And so a calorie is needed uh, for that to occur. And so there's four calories in one gram of protein. So when you just finish lifting weights, you go drink uh, your protein shake, your bro shake, that's about 20 grams of protein in it. Okay, there's gonna be 80 calories from that 20 grams of protein. Now what's important about proteins, okay, that they are built from amino acids, right? Amino acids are the building block of protein, okay? So a good analogy to help you remember the order, um, I like to use it in my class that amino acids are like little Lego blocks. And as you put the little Lego blocks together, they create different types of proteins, okay? So uh, we have a slew of amino acids, and most of these amino acid molecules are created by um, an amino group, a nitrogen and an, um, three hydrogens. And then a carboxyl group, and if you break it down, carboxyl, you'll notice that uh, there's carbon and there's some oxygen within that carboxyl, as well as a hydrogen atom, okay? And all of these atoms revolve around a center um, carbon atom, kind of like you see in the top right. Um, so amino acids create proteins. And now there's a couple different types of amino acids that you've probably heard of before. Okay, you have non-essential and essential amino acids. Now, you, your non-essential amino acids, these are the amino acids in your body that are produced naturally. So your body's making them right now as you're sitting to lecture. Whereas there are certain types of amino acids, okay, that have to be um, obtained from diet. So we're not going to dive into that. That's more 211. That is more nutrition, 345, sports nutrition, okay? Um, but what you want to know about protein is what do they do for the body? Well, it helps carry oxygen, and we talked about this in lab, 
Hemoglobin is a protein. It helps break down reactions. So in a moment, we're gonna talk about how ATP is created. And so these enzymes that help um, ATP be broken down, these enzymes that aid in maybe the Krebs cycle are made up of proteins. Your muscles, your myofibrils, which are the smallest contractile um, part of your muscle, actin and myosin, those are created by protein. That's why individuals will drink protein shakes after a workout for one reason. Um, your collagen or connective tissue is made up of protein. Okay, uh, prothrombin is, a, is for blood clotting, made up of protein, okay? And then protein also serves as a messenger for hormones, okay, specifically growth hormone. And your immune system, your antibodies are comprised of proteins. So this is just kind of the basic of protein. So the big thing I want you to recall from this slide here is how many calories are there in one gram of protein, that amino acids are the building block of proteins, and that protein is comprised of a carbon, a hydrogen, and oxygen in just different arrangements. Okay. So moving on from protein, because we're going to fixate a lot of our attention on carbs and fat, because those are our primary macronutrients that are going to create energy during cardiorespiratory fitness. So let's talk about fat. Now, first and foremost, look at the top right of this slide. This is a fat molecule. Notice all the carbons, hydrogen, and oxygen there are in a fat molecule compared to a protein. Then notice that you have nine calories for every one gram of fat. Nine calories per one gram. Is that a high amount of energy compared to what carbohydrates and protein give you? It is, okay? And so fat, out of the three macronutrients, will produce, or will not produce, but will give you the most amount of energy, okay? So just kind of asterisk that. Fat is always gonna give you the most amount of energy. That's why there's nine calories per one gram. Well, why, or rather how, does fat give me the most amount of energy when I'm exercising? Well, number one, it depends on the intensity and duration of exercise. We'll talk about that later. But number two, go back to the top right. Look at this fat molecule. Look at the amount of hydrogens and carbons. When we get into the science behind the energy systems, and how energy um, is utilized or produced to create a muscular contraction, you're gonna notice that there's gonna be a slew of hydrogen, carbons, and oxygen involved in that process. So with fat having a large amount of carbons, hydrogen, and oxygen, you can see as to why it's gonna give you nine calories of energy for every one gram that you are consuming, okay? And so fat is essential for, and we'll, we'll talk about this later um, in a few chapters, it's essential for thermal regulation, regulating body temperature. Fat, we need it to protect our vital organs. It helps us distribute our fat-soluble vitamins, which are vitamins A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. They help produce energy, okay? And they help form um, your cell membranes. Now, just some, some basics about fat, okay? Primarily, fat is stored as triglyceride, okay? The technical term is triacylglyceride, but we're gonna refer to it as triglycerides for this class. And so our body stores it as adipose or adipose tissue, okay? So when we are working with clients um, who are overweight or obese, this is the type of fat um, that is stored. And so essentially, um, a triglyceride, if you're looking at the top right picture, is a glycerol backbone with three fatty acid chains. So right here on the left side of the picture at the top right, this is the glycerol backbone, okay? And then as you see branching off, these are the fatty acids. So when we get into the energy systems and how fat 
is broken down to create energy and heat, we're going to notice that these three fatty acids are going to enter a process known as beta oxidation. And this glycerol, OL, a sugar, um, can be um, thrown into glycolysis, which we'll talk about later. Okay. Um, cholesterol, it's a fatty substance, right? It also has a carbon, a hydrogen, oxygen. We know that as cholesterol levels increase, that is going to increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, um, specifically LDL cholesterol. You have your phospholipids. It's a type of fat in the body. Um, there's an inorganic phosphate attached to it, and this is really kind of what plays a role in the structures of your cells. And then you have your lipo, excuse me, lipoproteins, LDL, HDL, um, and these carry molecules um, of fat into the bloodstream. So again, this here, your LDL and HDL, affects your overall cholesterol levels. So the higher LDL you have, um, the higher L, uh, total cholesterol levels are going to be. And then remember, your HDL is your good cholesterol, and we want that to be high. Um, okay. And then we're not going to worry too much about saturated and unsaturated fats because we're going to focus on primarily triglycerides. Any questions regarding the basics of fat? This should just be just a basic overview for y'all. Uh, we're just going to focus mainly on triglycerides, you said? Yep. So because triglycerides are going to be important when it comes to our energy systems and how we get ATP from one fat molecule. Because this is leading up to um, how is ATP formed from carb, a carbohydrate? How is ATP formed from fat? How is ATP formed um, from protein? But because we're talking about cardiorespiratory fitness, we are specifically going to talk about um, carbohydrates, how ATP is created from that, and then fat, how ATP is created from that. All right. And then finally, uh, carbohydrates, okay, CHO, again, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Uh, there's four calories per one gram. Okay, um, so again, make sure you know that fat nine, protein and carbohydrates, four calories. Um, this is the main fuel source of the body. So when people say carbs are bad for you, they don't know what they're talking about. Okay, um, it's gray. So it depends on, are you an athlete? What's your physical activity level? Okay, there's a slew of um, different scenarios in which carbohydrates um, are important and it varies from individual to individual. If you're an athlete, you need carbs. Okay, the problem with working with athletes and diet is most athletes care more about what they look like rather than their athletic performance. Um, so first rule of nutrition when you're working with athletes or you're working with um, anybody really is eat to improve health and then performance. But carbs are your main predominant fuel source um, in the formation of ATP. You have your monosaccharides, which are simple sugars. This is glucose, fructose, galactose. So for example, when you eat fruit, maybe uh, when you drink a Gatorade, those are some examples. You have your disaccharides. Now disaccharides are when you take any combination of glucose and fructose or two glucose, a glucose and a galactose, a fructose and a galactose. So you combine any of the two monosaccharides which gives you a disaccharide, mono one, di two, and then finally polysaccharides, poly many. And so you get this by um, com uh, combining three or more sugar molecules. And these are known as complex carbs because they take a little bit more time um, to digest, absorb, and assimilate in the body, okay? Um, so for our purposes, we are gonna focus essentially on the monosaccharides and how these simple sugars are digested, absorbed, and assimilated throughout the body. Now, when I say assimilated, does anyone know what that means? Assimilated. If you don't, that's okay. Like distributed, yeah. Yeah. So essentially, when I say metabolism, what does that mean to you guys? Because I know you have all heard this, the term before. What's metabolism? What's it to you? Um, 
like how fast your body burns calories. Would we agree? Would we all agree with that statement? Essentially. Yeah. So metabolism, right? We all talk about, oh, this person's got a fast metabolism. Oh, I've got a slow metabolism. So essentially, right, non-academic, it's taking the foods you consume and expending energy from it, okay? So this process is also known as cellular respiration, okay? But specifically, we're going to talk about the foods we consume, eat it. Step two is going to be digestion. We digest the food. Once our body digests the food, we're going to absorb the food. So that's it essentially getting into our bloodstream and then assimilation, distributing it throughout the cells to create energy or create um, energy for um, a contraction. Okay, so when it comes to, oops, sorry. When it comes to carbohydrates, right, uh, glucose is the most uh, predominant form of sugar, okay? That's why we see when we eat food, your blood sugars are naturally going to rise after a meal, and that's when insulin is going to be released. And so again, type 2 diabetics, they can't regulate their blood sugars because of um, they might be insulin resistant. And so we need this glucose to get into our muscles where it can be stored as glycogen. And your body stores glucose in two places, either the liver or the muscle. And so when um, glucose is stored in the form of glycogen, when it's stored in the liver, this is going to help regulate your blood glucose levels. So after I eat, insulin's release, glycogen, boom. It's going to be stored in the liver. That's going to help lower my blood sugar levels to a normal, st uh, normal state, less than 100 millig milligrams per deciliter. But my um, glucose can also be stored in the form of muscle glycogen. And when that happens, this glycogen is going to be saved as fuel for any type of physical activity or exercise. And we're going to talk about what that process is. How do we um, break down this stored muscle glycogen to create fuel for activity? So these are our three macronutrients. Those are the basics. That is the introduction to um, this lecture. Questions, comments, concerns to this point? All right. So this is how, uh, for example, carbohydrates are digested. So when you ate breakfast this morning, okay, so I had a breakfast burrito, a banana, and an orange, um, and some coffee. So I ingest the food. Okay, I swallow it via propulsion, okay, down into my esophagus where my stomach, okay, begins to digest it, okay? So the uh, process of chewing um, and then my stomach acids breaking down the food into smaller bits. This is the um, digestion portion and then through my small intestines. So what happens is once my food gets into my small intestines, I move to phase two, which is absorption. In this absorption phase, the nutrients from the foods I consume, so my breakfast burrito, my banana and orange, which had probably a high amount of carbohydrates, fat, and protein, okay, these nutrients as well as water, okay, in my blood vessel, uh, begin to go in my blood vessels and my lymph vessels, and the water um, is going to go through my blood vessels. And what happens is after I absorb it through my intestines, okay, we're going to move to the absorption. Now this here is of, the, is of the carbohydrates in my meal, for example, okay? So my monosaccharides, my glucose, my galactose, and my fructose. So after I've um, consumed it, I've proposed it, I've mechanically digested it, I'm gonna absorb it. And so what happens is when you absorb, okay, you'll see here in the small intestine, you need some sodium present to allow this glucose molecule, or the glucose is a monosaccharide that came from the wrap in my burrito, that came from my banana, that came from um, the oranges I ate. So I need a little bit of sodium, okay, in addition uh, to aid this glucose in entering the small lining of my intestines. Okay, so we're inside the cells of my small intestines here. 
So glucose gets absorbed, galactose gets absorbed. Notice that fructose, okay, does not require sodium to be absorbed. It just absorbs right through without it. Whereas glucose and galactose, I require sodium and I also need ATP for those two monosaccharides to be absorbed. You might say, okay, that's great. Well, from there, after it's absorbed, okay, the glucose, galactose, and fructose is shuttled into my capillaries. Okay, if you remember, um, capillaries are responsible for nutrient and gas exchange. So this is what we're seeing now, the nutrient exchange from the foods I consume. It's in my um, bloodstream via my capillaries, which is going um, to my working muscle tissue. And this is gonna to lead to the uh, portal vein and the liver. So the vein, right, this is gonna A, um, help with return of blood flow um, to the heart um, and then to the liver. Why is that important? Because my blood sugars, my glucose can be stored as liver glycogen here. And so digestion, I eat, I chew, I swallow, my stomach begins to break down. In the small intestines, I need sodium and ATP to absorb glucose and galactose into my small intestines with the help of a little bit of water to get into my capillaries where it is going um, to be used or stored as liver glycogen. So this is the process of digestion and absorption, okay? Now from there, after the absorption phase, like I said, it can get stored as um, glycogen. It can also get stored as muscle, uh, liver glycogen. It can also get stored as muscle glycogen. Um, we then begin into the assimilation phase. So essentially how it's gonna be distributed, how it's essentially going to be used um, for ATP generation and muscle force. Okay, so here we go. Energy for muscle force generation. So what is energy? Energy is essentially the potential to perform work or produce force. That's what energy is. The ability to perform work to uh, produce force. No matter what type of physical activity you are conducting, you need to um, create energy um, to perform that work. Whether it's walking to create a muscular contraction, running, up a hill, lifting weights, you need energy. Another key term that we need to know when it comes to energy is hydrolysis. And so hydrolysis is any type of reaction where there's an organic compound that is split via the presence or interaction of water, okay? And so you're gonna see an example of this in a minute. So you have energy, potential for performing work, producing force, we all know that ATP is right the primary mechanism for energy creation. Whereas hydrolysis, this is any type of reaction that we break down a, a big compound into smaller compounds via the presence of water. And so in the muscle, energy from the hydrolysis of ATP via myosin ATPase creates contraction. And so why myosin ATPase? Because myosin and actin interact to create a muscular contraction. So when you take 370, or if you're in that now, you've already learned that a little bit. So there's three different ways in which we can create energy. Here's the first way. And all three of these, make sure you know, highlight it, asterisk it, do what you need to do to understand it. So this is the simplest example of energy creation. You have adenosine triphosphate. It's going to interact with water via the enzyme ATPase. Now this is a protein. Remember, all enzymes are protein. When that ATP interacts with the water via ATPase, we are going to split this big compound and the water into one ADP, one inorganic phosphate, one hydrogen, thus giving us energy. Now, if you remember from lab lecture last week, hydrogen, as it builds up in our body, can be a waste product leading to fatigue. And you're gonna see why in a moment. So ATP plus water get via ATPase 
gives us ADP, inorganic phosphate, hydrogen, energy. Now notice that the arrows go both ways with this reaction. Why do the arrows go both ways? Any ideas? Any ideas why those arrows go both ways? Because the reaction can happen in the reverse order. Yeah, so the reaction can happen in reverse order, which gives us the resynthesis of ATP, which means if I go in reverse order, so I have that ADP, inorganic phosphate, hydrogen, and energy via ATPase, that is then going to flip that formula on its head and going to give me water and ATP, okay? And so I'm going to give you an example of that um, in a moment. And I'll also have some videos that I'm going to post today that um, you're going to want to watch before Wednesday as it piggybacks this, this lecture. The second formula is ADP plus CP, which is creatine phosphate, via the enzyme creatine kinase is going to give me ATP plus creatine. Well, that phosphate from the creatine phosphate just linked up with the ATP. So I went from adenosine diphosphate. This creatine becomes solo via creatine because it donated its phosphate to the ADP to create ATP via creatine kinase. We see this Okay, typically when we are performing activities of extremely high intensity, less than 10 seconds, this is the PCR energy system. We'll talk about that later. And then lastly, you can have two ADPs via adenylate kinase, which is the enzyme that gives us ATP and AMP, adenosine monophosphate. These are the three ways in which um, the hydrolysis of ATP, or sorry, the, how ATP essentially can be created. Now, let me throw my whiteboard up here. I'm going to draw it first and then so um, you guys can see it, all right? All right, so as I begin to hydrolysize ATP, okay, why does my body hydrolysize ATP? What's the whole purpose? To break it down for energy. Yeah, all right, so what happens there? So what's the whole premise? You break it down for energy to do what? Go deeper. Why? So your muscles can use it to do things? <laughs> yeah, so your muscles can use it to do things. So your muscles can perform a contraction in order to facilitate whatever physical activity it is, okay? So I'm always going to ask you why, why, why? Go deeper than you know. So here is example, right? Hydrolysis of ATP. ATP plus water gives me ADP plus hydrogen plus phosphate. I've done this three times to give you an example. So when this is occurring, this is allowing, right? This allows for a muscle contraction that's someone's bicep. That's great, great artwork. And then running or sprinting, okay? So what are the two other ways in which we can get ATP? What are the two other ways? What are the two other ways? What are the two other formulas that I gave you?
creatine and um, Okay, we'll start there. All right, so right, if we're performing activities of high intensity, less than 10 seconds, right, we got creatine phosphate floating around doing its thing. Okay, notice up top, the ATP, ATP plus water gives us ADP, hydrogen, and phosphate. What happens to the hydrogen and the other phosphates? What happens to the ADP? So what happens after this reaction occurs what's going on on the right side what do we the do ADP, the adp can react with the the cp to form A, atp right so we can take this extra adp right so maybe it drops down here oops so it drops down that extra adp now becomes adp plus cp which gives us atp plus P. See that? Oops, sorry, that's the uh, C. Well, what about these two ADPs up here? What can, what can happen to them? If this one joins with creatine, well, two ADPs. Excuse my handwriting. Well, those two ADPs here can become two ADPs. And that's going to, via adenylene kinase, gives me an ATP and an AMP. So you're going to see as you perform exercise, right, these three formulas continuing to interact with each other, whether there's a, a slew of hydrogen, whether there's a slew of phosphates that occur. Okay. So those three are very important to note, especially when um, we get down to chapter 15 and we talk about um, metabolic acidosis and what happens with all those extra, extra hydrogen ions, okay? And so as we finish out class for the last three minutes, these formulas are important to know as they lead us to the three mechanisms involved in resynthesizing ATP or recreating ATP, right? We break down ATP to create energy, to create muscle force within the working muscle tissue of whatever physical activity we're doing. And that, what I did on the whiteboard was an example of resynthesizing ATP using those three different formulas. This is what happens in your body. So we have three main energy systems that will resynthesize and recreate ATP. You have PCR hydrolysis, okay? This is that phosphocreatine taking, present, taking place in the presence of water. This is typical, typically activity that is extremely high um, in intensity and short in duration. You have glycolysis, which uh, we are creating, or not creating, but um, there's ATP involved from breaking down a, a glucose or glycogen molecule. Okay, so this is where we are creating pyruvate, and we'll talk about this on Wednesday. Um, this is essentially the um, metabolism. Um, this is where we're metabolizing glucose um, or, you know, fructose or any carbohydrate um, to muscle glycogen um, to give us ATP. So we can take glucose, we can take muscle glycogen to create ATP via glycolysis. And then we have oxidative phosphorylation. This is where we are resynthesizing ATP, but we are using oxygen to do it, okay? Now, the first two, these are um, our primary energy systems when it comes to anaerobic activities. And the last one is primarily aerobic, okay? Now, two things you wanna note is that the PCR hydrolysis energy system, um, it produces ATP very, very fast but it's a very, uh, it's highly fatigable. Whereas oxidative phosphorylation, it takes a while to produce ATP, but you get a large number. Um, so very fast, lower number of ATP produced in PCR, high number of ATP produced in oxidative phosphorylation, but a little bit slower, okay? And so we're gonna talk about all three of these energy systems on Wednesday 
and how um, your food is digested, absorbed, assimilated to aid in this resynthesis of ATP with these three different energy systems. And you'll make note, final note before we close out class that with the oxidative phosphorization energy system, carbohydrates, fat, and protein, and alcohol can be metabolized um, via the Krebs cycle. You'll also see it as the TCA or tricarboxyl um, acid cycle. We're going to keep it simple and refer to it as the Krebs or TCA cycle. Okay. And that this takes place in the mitochondria. These two take place outside of the mitochondria. Um, so that is all for today.